Great. Well, welcome everyone to our um, fall webinar. Um, we are excited to have had 180 people sign up from across Addison County and beyond joining us this evening. Um, all attendees will be muted. The chat will be open for you to say hello and where you're from and then close during Emily's presentation. Please find the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and post your questions there. We have posted um, the, our email link in the chat. And now Fran is going to read the land acknowledgement. Good evening. The towns of Addison County sit on land that belongs to the Western Abenaki, the traditional caretakers of these Vermont lands and waters, which they call Indakina, or homeland. This land has served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous people since time immemorial. We remember their connection to this region and the hardships they continue to endure. We give thanks for the opportunity to share in the bounty of this place and to protect it. We are all one in the web of life that connects people, animals, plants, air, water, and earth. And now I'm interested Introducing Jill, who's going to take the next segment. Good evening. A little, a little history. Pollinator Pathway of Addison County began in 2021 when Bethany Berry invited Fran Putnam, Brett Gilman, a student at Middlebury College, and others she knew to talk about gardens for pollinators. Brett introduced the group to Pollinator Pathway. The organization encourages rewilding and planting native plants, trees, and shrubs. Pollinators need swaths of native flower growth free of neonicotinoids or chemicals. The group members took steps to act locally and join the regional effort to help pollinators. They registered with Pollinator Pathway Northeast under Vermont, joining eight other states, sent out emails to friends and neighbors to create a steering committee and to find a coordinator for each town in Addison County, Vermont. Currently, there are coordinators in Bristol, Bridport, Cornwall, East Middlebury, Lincoln, Middlebury, Moncton, New Haven, Salisbury, Shoreham, Starksboro, Bridgens, and Whiting. The coordinators meet monthly with Bethany and Fran to support one another's efforts in educating about native plants, and pollinators and expanding areas on our own property and on our towns for wild plants in creating new pollinator friendly gardens, hosting local garden tours and finding ways to educate and or to reduce and or eliminate neonicotinoids and other pesticides. If you'd like to be part of Pollinator Pathway Addison County, send us an email at pollinator pathway dot addison cty at gmail.com now jenny morton town coordinator moncton will introduce our speaker jenny you're muted hi uh, first i'd like to just say that the pollinator pathway has created an education committee of which i'm pleased to be a member we're working on several things We'd like to present information about neonicotinoids and bills coming up regarding them possibly in January. In February, Sarah Salatino of Full Circle Gardens in Jericho will do a presentation on pollinator perennials and how to provide for them. We're also working on a two-part series on invasives, which would include both identifying and a field trip to see the actual plants. Keep watching for emails from the pollinator pathway and announcements in your local front porch forum. And now I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for tonight. Before I do this, just a reminder to please put any questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. The chat will be closed for this part of the presentation. Emily May is a pollinator conservation specialist with a pesticide program at the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. Emily first got interested in pollinators as an undergrad at Middlebury College studying biology and environmental studies, and she planted a pollinator garden on campus that is still outside Bicentennial Hall over a decade later. 
She received a master's degree in entomology from Michigan State University, where she studied pollinator habitat restoration, ground nesting bee ecology, and the effects of pest management practices on wild bee communities. Her work at Xerces in 2015 has focused on supporting crop pollinators through habitat creation and protecting bees and other beneficial insects from pesticides. And now I'm very pleased to present Emily May. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, so I'm Emily May, I'm a pollinator conservation specialist with the pesticide program at the Xerces Society. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share some information with you, which I hope will be interesting and useful for caring for pollinator and other wildlife habitat as we go into fall and winter here in Vermont. Let's see. Okay, so a little bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about over the next hour. Um, I'll start with a little bit of intro and background on just the general need for conservation of pollinators, um, which will be review, and then I'll get quickly into fall and winter habitat for different kinds of insects. Um, highlight a few uh, insects that use leaf litter and other um, other substrates for nesting over the winter. Um, talking about leaving the leaves, which you might um, have some questions about and saving the stems uh, for bee nesting habitat. Talk about some fall gardening tasks. And then I'll have a little section on the end because I get a lot of questions about this and I wanna try and answer some frequently asked questions about meadow establishment and maintenance. So talk about site preparation, talk about site, uh, seed mixes and then how you take care of it over the long term. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers at the end. So again, if you have come in with any burning questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat so I make sure that we answer them at the end. If you're not familiar with the Xerces Society, um, it's an organization I've been a part of since 2015. I'm based out of a home office here in Addison County. Um, the Xerces Society is an international conservation organization focused on invertebrates and their habitats. We were formed in 1971 as an organization of butterfly scientists. We're named for the butterfly pictured here, the Xerces blue butterfly, which was the first butterfly known to uh, be lost to extinction in the US from human activity and habitat loss. Um, and since that time, we've really grown into an organization focused on all invertebrates and their habitats, not just butterflies. And we have over 70 staff in over 20 states. Our work focuses on uh, pollinators and agricultural biodiversity. We also have programs in endangered species, protecting endangered species, protecting aquatic invertebrates. Um, my team is the pesticide team, which is actually more focused not on protecting pesticides, but on reducing their use and their impacts. Um, and then we have programs that are uh, Be Better Certified, Be City and Campus USA, which are um, programs to help cities and uh, college campuses become certified um, in pollinator habitat and integrated pest management planning, um, and then community science efforts like Bumblebee Watch and uh, Monarch Milkweed Mapper. So getting out and with the smartphone, helping scientists understand what's happening with pollinators around the country. Our pollinator and ag biodiversity team is all over the country. About half of it is uh, joint with the US Department of Agriculture uh, with partner biologist positions that help support farmers and land managers that are looking to install pollinator habitat through farm bill conservation programs. A lot of what you might be familiar with with Xerces is our resources. So this is what I spend a lot of time doing is just writing uh, and developing content like this that's helpful for folks that are wanting to support pollinators in their own spaces. We have plant lists, we have guides on how you can create and maintain habitat, um, how you can assess habitat for um, the different features that might be um, most beneficial or most efficient in your uh, on your property for pollinators and other beneficial insects. A lot of these are available on our website uh, as free PDF downloads. So let's let's go ahead and take that 3000 foot view here. What are we worried about? What are we trying to do with our fall gardens, with our summer gardens, with everything that we're doing in our spaces? There's an increasing number of studies showing declines in insects around the globe, uh, a worldwide compilation of long term insect abundance studies shows that the number of land dwelling insects is in decline. Um, 
on average, they found uh, a global decrease uh, that translates to approximately 24% over the, the 30 years of, of these long-term studies. So I think there's, there's ways to quibble about the percent of decline and the specific reasons why and where and how different groups of insects uh, may be struggling. But we know enough at this point to be concerned and to wanna to take action and we know that because some of these drivers are so strong, we need to move quickly to counteract some of the global and the local pressures on these important insects. The fate of the world's insects is really inseparable from our own. They're providing really important services in terms of soil health with nutrient cycling and decomposition, pest control. So there's all of these amazing insects out there with these complicated histories, life histories and interactions with other insects, but they're offering free pest control services in our gardens, on our farms, around our homes. They're also turning plants into food for other animals and they're helping plants reproduce. So all of these services uh, are happening around us. We're maybe not noticing them, but they are critical for the function of our ecosystems and the, the spaces that we live in too. Pollinators specifically are really important for our crops, for our food production. There are about 3,600 species of native bees in the US that are providing this incredible service. Um, many of them have a very different life history than the honeybees, which are the bees that we're all maybe familiar with for their amazing honey. But there's lots of other flower visiting insects also contributing to pollination of wild plants and crop plants. Um, flies and even mosquitoes uh, can contribute to pollination of different kinds of plants. But of course, at the same time that we're starting to appreciate these insects, we're realizing that there's this habitat loss that's happened across so many different types of landscapes from our agricultural landscapes to our urban and suburban landscapes. Uh, and that there's really not a lot of landscape left that's really undisturbed habitat for plants and animals. Um, so as we modify our landscapes, we are losing biodiversity, we're losing these natural resources and the ecological services that they provide. We really like neat and tidy landscapes, but a lot of the wildlife around us likes the mess, likes the undisturbed mess of um, what might have been here before we got here. So what we're what we're aiming for here is an attempt at rewilding our landscapes for the conservation of diversity. Uh, globally, we're losing biodiversity at an unprecedented rate, but farmers, gardeners, each of us can be a part of the solution. And we can conserve biodiversity and we can learn and benefit from it along the way. Aldo Leopold has this nice quote that I wanted to include. There's idle spots on, spots on every farm and every highway is bordered by an idle strip as long as it is. Keep cow, plow and mower out of these spots and the full native flora could be part of the normal environment of every citizen. So there's lots of spaces where we can add diversity, where we can bring wildness back into our landscapes. Um, and I hope you'll, you'll think about that as you look around um, and maybe we don't need to be quite as tidy as, as we've always been. So in terms of the basics on habitat, uh, habitat is what provides food and shelter for, uh, for different insects and, and wildlife. Supporting pollinators happens throughout their entire life cycle. The basic needs are food. So for pollinators, that's nectar and pollen rich plants that have continuous bloom as long as they're active. It also means for butterflies, larval host plants that they're feeding on during their development. It means shelter. So places for them to nest and overwinter, um, take cover. And then protection from disturbance. That means protection from pesticides, which is a whole other talk protection from other management activities like tillage um, and, and excessive mowing, that kind of thing. Um, and there's also other considerations like how connected is that habitat to other existing habitat features um, for pollinators, how close is it perhaps to a garden or a crop that they might be pollinating and providing services to. Of course, gardening for pollinators is supporting more than just pollinators. So pollinators are a great place to get into wildlife conservation because when you put in habitat for pollinators, you're also supporting this huge diversity of other wildlife, like the predatory and parasitic insects that provide biological control of insect pests of garden plants and crops. 
but creating wildlife habitat increases diversity at lots of levels, building resilience into our systems. But here, we're, we're here to talk about winter habitat. You know, typically when we think about and talk about gardening for pollinators, we're thinking about the flowers, we're thinking about their summer habitat, but where do insects and other invertebrates go in the winter? The vast majority, other than the ones that are migrating out, are overwintering or spending winter right where they spent all summer. They're just less active and more hidden. So lots of invertebrates, which are spineless animals, you know, lots of things um, beyond insects too. They're reliant on fallen leaves and other organic debris to cover and insulate them from the elements. So whatever your landscape is, you can make sure that there are resources for that nesting and overwintering habitat available. So these are Luna moths. These are one example of an insect that disguises their cocoons as dried leaves, blending in with real leaves in the leaf litter. Luna moths are found in most deciduous mixed forests of Eastern North America, as far north as Canada, as far south as Mexico, and they occur in several generations every year. Uh, Luna moth eggs are smaller than the head of a pin and they are uh, coated in this brown adhesive that helps them cling to their uh, host plant. But as winter approaches and the leaves start to fall, the pupa of Luna moths will overwinter hidden in their cocoons in the leaf litter. This is a morning cloak butterfly. This is a large butterfly with velvety brown wings and yellow to white wing edges. This is one of the first butterflies you'll see emerging in the spring. It comes out on some of the first warm days, often even before all the snow has melted. Morning cloak adults hibernate throughout the New England winter. This and several other species of butterflies, um, including the Eastern comma and question marks, have evolved the capability to produce an antifreeze kind of agent which stops ice crystals from forming in their blood, their equivalent of blood, if temperatures go below freezing. So morning cloaks try and spend the winter in some kind of a sheltered place, like a rock crevice or under uh, the bark of a tree, under a leaf or in a wood pile. Um, so there are usually uh, no blooming flowers in early spring when morning cloaks come out. So they're, they're feeding mostly on tree sap, especially from oaks. Uh, and they'll also feed on animal droppings and decaying things too. This is the red banded hair streak, which lays their eggs on fallen oak leaves, which become then the first food of the caterpillars when they emerge. The red banded hair streak is a southeastern species, uh, but we have lots of other hair streaks here in Vermont. Um, we have the coral hair streak, which lays its eggs on twigs or in leaf litter at the base of cherry trees, its host plant. We have the hickory hair streak, uh, hair streak, which overwinters as eggs laid in the leaves of hickory, as well as ash and oak trees. Um, the caterpillars of that species hide in the leaf litter during the day, and then they emerge at night to feed on leaves and fruit. This is a chrysalis of a tiger swallowtail butterfly. Swallowtail butterflies disguise their chrysalises as dried leaves, again, to blend in with real leaves, camouflage. Swallowtails overwinter as a chrysalis in a state of diapause. Diapause is like the insect version of, of hibernation. Um, so the larvae, they usually are two, I think two broods a year of swallowtail butterflies. The larvae that experience the shortening days of late summer enter diapause after transforming into pupa and the pupa stop developing and then wait for increasing day length and warmer temperatures to emerge as adults in the spring, uh, like May and June. So this, this is another butterfly species like the morning cloak that will produce antifreeze compounds to protect them from freezing through the winter. This is the chrysalis of a common buckeye butterfly attached to a seed head of a flower. Other species also blend in well among the standing vegetation in our gardens. This is actually a species that doesn't overwinter here in Vermont. It's migratory like the monarch and the final northern generation heads south in late summer, early fall. But I just thought this chrysalis was so beautiful and well blended in that I wanted to include it. The great spangled fritillary is the largest of Vermont's fritillary butterflies. It spends the winter as a newly hatched caterpillar hidden in the leaf litter. The mom lays eggs near uh, or sometimes on the base of violets in the fall. Violets uh, are its host plant, wild and cultivated violets. So the cater um, caterpillar emerges from its egg but doesn't eat until the following spring. It spends the winter as a caterpillar hiding in the leaf litter 
And then as the violet leaves start to emerge in the spring, the caterpillar will start to eat and grow, continuing its metamorphosis process. So its uh, secret weapon for survival is extreme secrecy. The caterpillar hides in fallen leaves during the day and only re returns to its food plants at night. And it's hard to spot. And so, so much so that I actually went looking for and was not able to find a photograph of it that I could use for this presentation. This moth, the six spotted gray, is really well camouflaged in leaf litter. This uh, is a species that feeds on dog, dog bane as larvae. There's just so many hundreds of brown moths and butterflies. You know, these are the species that are maybe using leaves for the cover and shelter. They're so well blended in. And there's lots of other arthropods and other animals like amphibians, um, snakes that need the cover and shelter from leaves. This, if you look hard, there is a uh, leaf litter crab spider in here that is very brilliantly camouflaged, looking just like a pebble. Ground beetles are another common and diverse group of insects found in leaf litter. We have dozens of species of ground beetles, uh, just an incredible diversity. These beetles are really important biological control agents in agricultural and garden systems. They control insect pests uh, as well as weed seeds. So these uh, ground, different ground beetles consume all kinds of soft-bodied insects, um, including grubs of other beetles, fly maggots and pupa, ants, aphids, slugs, um, and then some species also consume seeds of species like crabgrass, velvet leaf, lamb's quarters, red root amaranth. Um, they can actually be an important contributor to weed control in some systems, consuming uh, their body weight in food daily. The larvae of many of these species live on the soil surface in leaf litter and most overwinter as adults in the soil. So these insects are some that benefit from some mess and some less disturbance. And then finally, I'll talk about the walking stick. Walking sticks are another kind of really awesome looking insect that depend on leaf litter at some point in their life cycle. These are mostly wingless insects that graze on the leaves of a variety of different kinds of trees. Um, they don't generally cover a lot of ground, so you don't see damage, like really extensive damage like you would from spongy moths or other winged forest pests. Um, and then these insects are providing food for a variety of birds and mammals. Northern, northern walking sticks mature in late summer, early fall, and the females that are up in the tops of trees drop more than 100 eggs from the tops of those trees that they're living in. The eggs fall to the ground uh, where they overwinter in the leaf litter until spring. Um, and I don't have a picture of the eggs, but they look just like seeds. And actually a portion of the outside of the walking stick egg is edible, which mimics a similar area on the outside of plant seeds that depend on um, ants for distribution. So ants will take the eggs or the seeds uh, back to their nest, eat the little edible part, and then toss or bury the rest in their waste heap in the anthill underground. So in the spring, the walking sticks will hatch uh, safely below ground and then just walk out of the ant nest. Um, there's some really amazing interactions that are happening where we don't generally see them. So if you came to this presentation thinking I was going to give you a ton of homework for your garden, I have some really great news for you. I'm actually here to tell you to do less. Uh, there are so many invertebrates that rely on fallen leaves. And the best way to conserve this important segment of the animal world and the food web that's happening out there is to leave leaves, or at least some leaves, um, to provide overwintering habitat for pollinators and other wildlife. So the leaves don't have to be left exactly where they fall to be able to provide cover and, and habitat. So knowing that thick leaves can kind of smother out grass, um, if you do want to keep areas of grass open, you can gently rake, uh, otherwise corral those leaves into garden beds or around tree bases or into other sort of designated areas where they can help suppress weeds, retain moisture like a mulch and provide nutrients back into the soil. Um, so you can spread those around uh, into your beds and add a layer as, as a, you know, as mulch. So if you're wanting to protect the insects and the eggs that might already be present in that leaf litter, I would caution you to avoid shredding leaves with a mower. Um, raking will keep leaves whole for the best cover um, and protect those insects and eggs that are still living there. 
blowing is a little bit less gentle, but does keep leaves whole. So you could think of that as maybe a step down from gentle raking, which is a step down from leaving them undisturbed altogether. But all of these are uh, a step up from mowing, bagging, and removing the leaves from your yard altogether, because these are an important source of habitat for a lot of different kinds of insects. Doug Tallamy's group, Homegrown National Park, has a great social media presence. And these are some of their ideas for ways you could use leaves that I didn't have pictures for. You can leave them when, where they fall. You could rake a lay, light layer into garden beds, pile around trees to make new beds, mulch around uh, shrubs and perennials, use them as a layer of carbon material and active composting, or pile them up for passive composting or leaf jumping fun. Lots of ways to use leaves. So that, that's a small introduction to leaving the leaves, which I know has been a bit of a paradigm shift over the last few years for many gardeners. Putting gardens to bed for pollinators is actually a lot less work than the way we might have learned how to clean up gardens. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily want to spend hours bagging leaves, so I'm happy to be able to say I'm doing my part to save pollinators and other insects. <laughs> Um, let's talk about the second part of fall and winter management, which is saving the stems. So let's talk about bee biology. If you've attended other webinars on pollinators, if you've revved up on the lives of native bees, this is going to be familiar to you, but it's always good to review the biology when we're trying to figure out how to conserve insects. So we have about 275 species of native wild living uh, bees in Vermont, and there are tremendous diversity among those hundreds of species with a wide range of sizes and shapes and colors, diverse life histories and, and nesting biology. Most of the bees that we have here nest in the ground, but about 30% nest in plants, um, that's stems and wood. And then a small number are bumblebees nest in cavities. So their favorite place to nest would be something like an abandoned mouse nest out in the grassy field. Dozens of Vermont's bee species nest above ground in plant stems and wooden tunnels. These range from tiny little stem nesters like small carpenter bees and yellow-faced bees to larger tunnel nesters like mason and leafcutter bees. And the availability of that nesting habitat is one of the most important factors influencing the populations of our, of our native bees. So just to give you an example of a stem nester, this is an example of a ceratina nest. Ceratina are the small carpenter bees. These are tiny little metallic green-blue bees in the same family as carpenter bees, the big ones, honeybees, bumblebees, um, and a few other kinds of bees. They don't have much hair on their bodies, so they kind of look like small little wasps if you're not familiar with them, but you'll see them visiting. Once you know what they look like, you'll see them on lots of different kinds of plants in summertime. And they nest in pithy plant stems. So things like blueberry, elderberry, and sumac canes, bee balm stems, anise hyssop stems. Um, and that center picture is a bee excavating a stem nest. That's last year's growth cut off in spring. These bees are called carpenter bees, but unlike the big ones that you'll find in your shed, they're not able to actually bore in through tough woody stems. So these, these small bees need that soft pith to be exposed. Um, so she'll dig down, she'll start provisioning the base of her tunnel with pollen and nectar, lay an egg on it, and then uses a bit of uh, ground up woody pith to make a partition or a wall inside the nest, then repeat that pollen and nectar gathering for another egg, another wall, continue until she'll fill up the stem. So some species of these small carpenter bees will then start a new nest once they've filled up one stem or twig, and others will actually just remain at the nest guarding the stem and entrance from parasites and predators and then doing some periodic ex uh, inspection and cleanup of their brood. And sometimes females will share guarding duties uh, among nests that are close together. Some species of bees also nest in wood above ground, so standing snags and logs and stumps and brush piles can be important contributors to some of the nesting and overwintering habitat you might have on your property. Um, some bees can chew cavities with their jaws, like large carpenter bees, but most of these above ground nesting bees depend on boring beetles um, for their nest cavity and other things that actually are doing the excavation work beforehand. So boring beetles equals interesting bees. Um, dead wood and wood boring insects, two things that we tend to want to get rid of, are actually really important for these kind of bees. 
Logs provide resources during all stages of that de decomposition process. This is the metallic green sweat bee, Agachlora pura, which is a native solitary wood nesting bee that nests in decaying and rotting wood. And it's such a beautiful bee. Uh, so if you wanna see this kind of bee in your yard, keep that rotting log around. These bees are just so beautiful. So I'm gonna walk through the steps of how to create habitat for stem nesting bees, how to save the stems. Um, Cause many of you may have come to questions, come with questions about leaving the leaves and saving the stems. So it's actually quite easy to do this once you get used to kind of the annual ritual of it. So here we are in the fall. What are we gonna do now? We're going to leave new growth of flower stalks intact over the winter. So did it put out a flower head this year? Did it make seeds? We're gonna leave that be. Um, in this case, doing less is doing more to save the bees. So those standing stems and those seed heads that those plants produce this year are also gonna be providing cover and structure and food for birds and other wildlife. Um, this is true also for shrubs and trees that maintain their leaves during the winter that provide cover from wind and snow. Um, and those fruits and seeds can provide food into the winter months for birds. So in terms of our plants, our perennials, um, in spring we come back and we cut the plant growth from last year. So next spring we'll go out and we'll be cutting back the plant stems that grew this past summer. Um, typically bees are nesting in the second year growth. These are dried out plant stems, not the new growth. Um, so next spring, you're going to be opening up those stems for bees, uh, like small carpenter bees, to be able to find and get in there. Female bees are going to find the cut open stems um, to start their nest. And they'll, they'll start that whole process of laying eggs on pollen balls. Um, so what you want to do is to be leaving a variety of heights, more than eight inches tall. So you don't want to take those stems all the way down to the ground. You want to be leaving enough room for a bee to be able to get in there and form a tunnel nest. Um, so I tend to err on the side of cutting high, but you can leave stubble of, of a variety of heights there to provide those nesting cavities. In the summer, the new growth of the perennial is going to hide that stem stubble, and then the bee larvae are going to develop in the cut stems. And then come next fall, you are again going to leave those new stems standing through the winter. Um, and then bees are gonna be hibernating in the cut stems from last year. So thinking ahead to next year, they'll be in the stems that grew this year. Uh, and then other insects and birds are gonna be using the standing plants and the seed heads for food and shelter again. So spring after that, cut back the new growth again. Uh, and the old stems where bees were hibernating are going to start to naturally break down at this point. Um, unless you feel really desperate about it at that point, you don't wanna trim those back yet. Um, adult, adult bees are going to emerge from those old stems, start nests in the newly cut dead stems, and then in other naturally occurring open stems. You can usually find those two-year-old cut stalks if you try, but you, I think uh, generally speaking, I don't really see a need to fully remove them because they do get covered up and eventually break down. So if you're looking to create stem nesting habitat for bees in this way, some of their preferred nesting plants are in this list. Um, it's some plants in the mint family, like hyssop and bee balm, some plants in the aster family, like sunflowers, uh, cone flowers, goldenrod, uh, and then some berry plants and shrubs. These are all really highly used plants when there are open stems available. So if you have these plants in your garden already, this is where I would look if you're curious if you already have stem nesters. Um, closely, look closely at cut stems from these kinds of plants. And that's, that's what we're doing to be able to support pollinators and other wildlife year round. Um, and as always, I find it helpful to, if you have neighbors that question you about your messy gardening, putting up a sign can really go a long way to kind of allay curiosity and also get them interested in talking to you about what the heck you're doing in your, in your messy, messy yard. Um, I did wanna pause here and talk about some exceptions to leaving leaves. Um, if we think about uh, our gardens and also our native perennials, there are many things that overwinter um, that we might not want to carry into the next year. So in terms of things like um, 
plant diseases like powdery mildew, I'm going to be cutting out my plants that have, this is my bee balm that has powdery mildew in it. I'm going to be cutting that out and bagging it up and taking it out of the yard because I don't want to carry it in uh, and overwinter that inoculum into next year. Generally speaking, this kind of diseased plant material uh, is not going to be taken care of by composting. Compost generally isn't hot enough um, to destroy some of these diseases. So for these kinds of plant materials, I would bag it up and, and get rid of it. Um, you're probably most familiar with this um, if you do vegetable gardening. I'm always going to be bagging and disposing, um, you know, blighted tomatoes and that kind of thing. That's true too if you have backyard apple trees, um, can clean up apple drops and then flail mow those leaves to reduce inoculum and overwintering pests. So this is an area where I'm not going to be leaving my leaves. I will say this, I, this is a tool I picked up this year. This is a golf ball picker upper and it has been super useful for cleaning up apple drops. Um, really effective and my son um, who is one and a half loves to use it. So um, this is an area of disease prevention that um, will hopefully help you be able to manage your apples, you know, without using pesticides. Um, so I would say disease prevention is, an, is definitely an area of exception for leaving leaves. There are other fall garden tasks related to disease prevention, like taking the time at this point to clean and disinfect garden pools and plant supports for next year, using some kind of 10% bleach, bleach solution, allowing it to soak off and drying them off with a towel. Um, this is a great way to prevent disease causing pathogens from spreading around your garden or your yard, um, both during a growing season and then in between. So this is a nice pause moment to be able to go in and clean your tools. Um, Another thing to consider for next season is crop rotation. So changing the planting location of a specific crop within the garden each season. This is my son enjoying those tomatoes. I will not be planting tomatoes or peppers in that part of the garden next year. I'll rotate them around so that I'm not bringing that same disease material in. Crop rotation is gonna help reduce damage from insect pests, limit vegetable disease development and help maintain soil fertility. Um, yeah, so the eggplants, peppers, potatoes, tomatoes, they're all part of the same family. Um, and early blight could affect all of those different crops. And it survives in plant debris in the soil, which is its main source of inoculum and on seeds. So it's best prevented by crop rotation, but it's also the reason that I end up um, pulling out some of my plant material at the end of the season. There's really a rhythm, um, thinking now not about the garden, but in terms of native perennials, um, there's a rhythm to tending a native landscape that becomes this familiar ritual every year, which includes seed collection. So while you want to probably renew weeds uh, from your flower and garden beds now to reduce seed carryover, it's also a great time to collect seeds from plants that you'd like and then grow more next year. <coughs> So you can absolutely collect, store, stratify, grow out native seeds from your property. It's a really enjoyable process that can provide you uh, with relatively low cost plants. Um, my process is one of sort of incremental growth. I'm sort of time limited because I have a toddler, um, <laughs> but I'm not gonna be going out and, and doing everything at once. Um, it's, it's small projects here and there. So I start by initially transplanting in the native species that I want, and then using the seed from those plants to increase quantity over time. You can create you know, larger, more attractive swaths of single species. You can try new spots for plants that didn't work out so well in their initial planting spot. My backyard is moist clay plain soil. My front yard is kind of well-drained ledgy soil. Um, so some things grow better in one place or the other. This year, things generally did better in the back with all that moisture um, during the dry part of the year. The other great thing about seed collection is that you can share with friends and family. Um, so this photo is containers of native seed collected from plants in my coworker's yard. Um, and she will just let those seeds dry out in the house once the heat is on, helping to sort of prevent any rotting type of issue and then stores them in paper lunch bag. I prefer to sort of sow seeds outdoors in the fall after a few killing frosts. Um, some native species need cold stratification to be able to germinate, which means they need that period of winter cold 
and then the freeze thaw cycle to in the spring to be able to break dormancy. So if you sow outdoors in the fall, you don't have to worry about trying to stratify seeds indoors. You can just sow, sow directly on the soil or you can sow into, into pots with soil and some wire mesh on top to prevent, you know, chipmunks and other birds getting in there if you're wanting to prevent that. Um, if you're wanting to sow in the spring, you may wanna look into how to pursue cold stratification indoors to help the species that need it be able to break dormancy in the spring. So there's, I feel like a lot more I could talk about in terms of seed collection. If you're interested in that more broadly, um, there's protocols for ethical wild collection. Um, wild seed collection can get you closer to local ecotypes, to those plants that are well adapted to your local conditions, but you do have to know what you're doing and make sure that you're not doing any harm to local populations. You might need permits, you might need permissions to be able to collect seed from a particular piece of land. And you have to be able to sort of assess population size and seed output and make sure that your seed collection is not going to be, uh, is going to be able to be tolerated in that population. If you're interested in learning more about seed collection, I'd recommend that you Google the BLM Seeds of Success program, which has native seed collection protocols and guidance that help, um, help point you towards more ethical collection. Um, and there's, there's lots of other resources out there about seed collection, but I would make sure you know what you're doing when you get into it. And then at this point, you know, the other fall garden tasks is then to take a step back review and plan. So this is a, a screenshot from my old uh, house where I was living before I came to my house here in Edison County. And every year I would take a step back and think, okay, what incremental changes am I going to make to my garden next year? What plants worked well? What plants didn't work well? Uh, are there any missing habitat elements? Um, is there, am I missing spring plants? Am I missing, you know, trees and shrubs and woody early, early blooming species? And then take that step to make plans for next year. Um, get excited about what you're going to be doing with your pollinator gardening in the next year. Xerces has some helpful guides if you're interested in, in being able to sort of be guided through the assessment of what features you might be missing on your property. Um, this is a habitat assessment guide for pollinators in yards, gardens, and parks, and it'll kind of help walk you through, okay, I have some flowering species in spring and some in summer, maybe I don't have enough nesting habitat. Um, hopefully these are easy enough for you to be able to use and zero in on some strategies that might be needed on your property. So small review, <laughs> do clean up disease and insect affected plants and bag them up and get rid of that plant debris. Don't clean up healthy perennials and grasses and leaves. Um, I hope that's pretty easy advice to follow. Reflecting on the intentions for the garden can help decide whether and how it makes sense to manage and to intervene. Um, you know, thinking about my own yard, some of my goals are to conserve and support the diversity of insects and birds and other wildlife living around me with native flowering plants. I want a beautiful space that I enjoy watching in the mornings and the evenings. Um, and that given that I have a toddler and I have a busy life, one of my goals is to manage land with as little effort as possible. I want a system that is healthy and functional with minimal disturbance. So by keeping the goal of rewilding front and center, it's easier for me to accept untidiness in my yard and even to love and appreciate and enjoy it. Um, if you're used to mowing and bagging and cleaning or even simply used to that sort of nice wide open stretch of lawn, moving to a messier looking garden definitely can take a shift in perspective. I have this patch of golden rods and cone flowers and stinging nettles and hairy white aster outside my kitchen window. And my husband looks out there and he thinks, well, that looks kind of terrible. <laughs> Do you want me to clean that up? Um, and my response is almost always, wait, take a minute, just watch. Do you see movement? Do you see life in that, that patch? Do you see the finches on the cone flower? Do you see the late season bumblebees on the aster and the goldenrod? What is there that you might not see that's hidden in the thatch and under the soil? So let it be let it live and enjoy it. And reflecting on those intentions and goals helps, um, helps to live with it. So that's sort of gonna wrap up my section there on fall gardening task. And I'm gonna switch gears 
for the rest of this presentation. Some of it is relevant to fall management. Um, some of it is all season. But I wanted to talk about pollinator meadow establishment a bit um, because I get a lot of questions about this. And I know there's a lot of interest through the, the PPAC group in meadow establishment. Maybe you have an old hay field that you're wanting to bring to life. Maybe you have an area of lawn that you're wanting to turn into wildflowers for bees. So this last section of the presentation is for you. And I'm hoping I can try and answer some of those questions I've been getting. So if you want an end product that looks something like this, a beautiful meadow, I'm here to tell you growing diverse perennial wildflowers is incredibly rewarding. Um, but it takes a lot of effort and native wildflowers can challenge you in ways that you might not be used to if you're used to growing other plants from seeds that grow robustly and quickly. So if only everything grew like a sunflower, this would be a lot easier. The seed for these native perennial meadow plantings can be pretty costly. Um, so I'll talk mixes in a minute, but I did want to just start by saying, if you want your money's worth and you want a beautiful meadow, you do need to put in effort up front to make it work. And the number one reason that I see perennial meadows fail is inadequate site prep or control of the competitive weedy species, including the seeds that are just living there in the soil in the area that you're trying to plant. So I think probably a lot of you either know of or have fallow areas that were previously pasture or hay fields. And those usually do have some great pollinator plants in them already, like goldenrods and asters, maybe some milkweeds. Um, but they're also usually chock full of competitive grasses and bed straw and plantain and maybe some poison parsnip. Um, native wildflowers are these incredible plants, but they are absolute wimps sometimes when they are grown from seed. So you do have to take care of the plant bullies so that you can get your de desired plants in there and they can have their room to grow. Um, and this can take a season or more, depending on what you have in there already. The idea is you use a method or a combination of methods that continuously eliminates and exhausts the weeds and the weed seed bank. Um, so just doing like a till in the fall and seeding wildflowers into it, like you might do with an annual crop or a cover crop, um, is not going to set you up for success. It's going to set you up for a weedy planting that does not look like what you would imagine. So I would say don't skip this step. Don't pass go if you want a beautiful, diverse native meadow that sticks around for the long term. Um, you have to think about how you're going to take care of the bullies ahead of time. Most of the meadow projects that I see fail because, as I said, of that inadequate site prep weed control. There's lots of different ways to control weeds. The most effective for you is going to depend on your site, how big it is, what you're dealing with, what materials you have access to. So I have. Good news for those of you that are converting just lawn, like mowed sod or turf into a meadow, you have it easiest. You've basically been running a smother crop in there for years with your lawn. So you could actually just rent a sod cutter, remove the turf, maybe add a little compost and then seed right away. Um, so that's pretty easy. I know Taylor Rentals on Route 7 has, one, has a sod cutter for rent. There's probably other businesses in the area that offer them as well. Um, those of you who are trying to convert an old hay field or a weedy pasture have a much more difficult task. Um, three of the methods that I've seen that are effective up here are tarping, black plastic tarping, sheet mulching, and herbicide. And I'll talk about sheet mulching on the next slide. Um, black plastic tarp is more effective than the clear solarization plastic up here in the Northeast. Um, and basically how this works is you put the tarp down in the spring, you leave it through the full season. It ideally needs to be dug in at the sides to prevent airflow, um, weight it down, and then protect it from getting holes and animal damage. Um, but if you have really challenging weeds, you have a large site, um, several herbicide applications over the growing season to take care of those uh, flushes of weeds might be the most effective option. We urge you to use non-persistent herbicides for this purpose, not least because the wildflowers that you would be seeding into it will not germinate well in an area with a history of persistent herbicide use. Um, and then some other options, um, smother cropping, like with a thick cover crop of buckwheat and then repeated shallow cultivation or mowing are also options but they really um, are, are generally only effective in low weed pressure situations and the species that aren't gonna just you know, spread more with tillage, for example. 
So one option that might appeal to some of you converting smaller areas um, is sheet mulching. This is also called lasagna gardening. So it's basically just using multiple thick layers of carbon and nitrogen or brown and green materials to smother out existing weeds and grasses. And fall is actually a great time to do sheet mulching because you have lots of organic materials available from leaves and from grass climbing, tripping, trimmings. You can just let them sit and break down through the winter. Um, so the way this works is you collect lots of materials and then you alternate brown and green layers. So carbon layers or brown layers, roughly twice as thick as green layers, just like composting. Um, and you can start with half an inch of cardboard or shredded newspaper as a bottom layer for that smothering effect. Composted manure is also a great layer to include along with straw or grass clippings. You want to get it really nice and thick. It's going to break down considerably. Um, and then once it's broken down, you can plant right into it. Um, I know Fran and Spence and Waybridge are using this to prepare an area on their property and it looks awesome. Um, it can be used for transplants or for seed. So I've now talked your ear off about site prep. Hopefully I've, I've knocked that message home, but let me also do so about seed mixes. Um, we've talked a little bit about collecting seeds to help spread native plants around your property, but I do get a lot of questions about meadow mixes. So I wanted to just talk some basic principles when you're trying to figure out if you're getting a good mix. So hopefully I'm not getting into too much detail here. I, as a reminder, this presentation is being recorded and will be posted to YouTube. So you can come back to it for these kinds of details when you need them. Um, this is an example of a custom seed mix uh, designed for monarchs in upstate New York. Um, generally speaking, we're wanting mixes consisting of native species that are providing those pollen and nectar resources, host plant resources and nesting sites. So we want several species blooming at any given time throughout the year. Um, and that's the basics. So then um, when we design these mixes for pollinators, we want to achieve a diversity of flowering plants that persists over the long term. And the best way that we have found to achieve this through a lot of trial and error in restoration is to seed mixes that have this high forb to grass ratio. Um, Grasses are great. Grasses are great at establishing quickly, which is good for securing the soil when you've created this bare spot for your meadow. They provide structure, um, but they will also compete. They will also swamp out forbs if they are a high percentage of the mix. Uh, a lot of pre-made mixes that you'll buy are 50% or more grasses, which is why in part they're less expensive. Grass is a very fluffy seed. It's not hard to collect, um, but those are not going to give you that long lasting meadow diversity that you might be looking for. So generally, rule of thumb, we're aiming for a very high forb to grass ratio, 75% or so flowering plants and 25% grasses. The other thing that we look for in mixes is the amount of actual live seed going into the ground. Um, in most contexts around here, you're wanting about 40 to 60 live seeds per square foot uh, to get good meadow establishment. So we end up calculating this out. That's why we have this, you know, complicated calculator here um, to be able to uh, make sure that that's the amount that's going into the ground. So one of the things to look for when you go into the store and look at packages of seed mixes is what percent do they actually include of live seed? And I'll, I'll go through an example of that in a second. But if you're looking for a custom or pre-made mix, I would recommend looking for mixes from companies that specialize in seed production, especially of native plants um, and different companies and nurseries are gonna vary in, in what they have available and their relative costs. If you have questions about a specific meadow project, feel free to reach out to me for more information. I am happy to chat about it with you. So I just wanted to give you one example of what to look for or avoid in a store-bought mix. Um, so just looking at the back here, you know, the first thing I look at is the species mix, and most of the species in this one are introduced annual plants. Um, some annuals can provide good nectar for pollinators, but in general, these kinds of introduced annual species are going to be lower value than native perennials for our wildlife. Um, the ones that have an asterisk on the side there are perennial and native-ish, um, but you'll notice that these are farther down the list in order of predominance or what percent of the mix they make up. 
So one of the other things you'll see here is that they don't actually give you the percent of the mix that each species makes up, um, which means I can assume that these native perennials make up a very tiny fraction of the mix. Um, the next thing that I see is circled up on the top there, but it's the mix only contains 1.24% pure seed and the rest of the package is just bulking material for the mix. So in this big package, um, which looks like you're getting lots of mix, you're actually only getting a small amount of seed. Um, so I don't think you're getting your money's worth in this kind of a mixture and I would, I would walk away from this kind of a mix. If you are looking to buy ready-made mixes, there are some good options for pre-designed native perennial mixes out there. Two catalogs you might look at with Northeast perennial mixes are Ernst Conservation Seeds and Prairie Moon Nursery. These are by no means the only ones, um, but they have some a wide selection for building custom mixes. So I often are coming, I'm often coming here for meadow clients. And I will say some of these mixes are expensive. So when you're looking at how much to order, measure out your space, see if you can calculate out 40 to 60 seeds per square foot. Um, and again, take a look at how much grass is in the mix. Um, some places are gonna offer mixes without grasses, which is a great option, because then you can order grass separately to get your mix to about 20 or 25% grass. Um, and you can hand collect seed from your own plants to reduce cost and bump up the amount of forbs that you're able to seed in. Um, a lot of custom mixes end up being expensive because of specific plants that are just hard to grow or in really high demand like milkweeds. So if you're making a custom mix with one of these kinds of companies and you can hand collect seed to fill in the expensive gaps, that can really help keep your costs down. Like build out a mix, don't include milkweeds, hand collect milkweeds from other places around your property where you already have them. And that will help keep those seed costs much lower. Okay, so I'm almost done here. Um, let's come back to the fall stuff, talk about seeding. So you have your extremely well-prepared seed bed, you have your seed mix, now you can seed. The best timing for seeding native perennials really kind of follows the timing of when those seeds are hitting the ground in nature in fall. But when we're seeding out an expensive seed mix, we wait for a few killing frosts just to make sure that our seeds are not gonna accidentally break dormancy early in the fall. Um, so here in Vermont, that usually means after late October, early November, a few killing frosts are already in, underway here. For larger areas, you might think about broadcast seeding with a tra tractor mounted seeder or a seed drill if you have access to those. But for smaller areas, like most of you would be working with um, where you're hand broadcasting seed, these tips are mainly to ensure that you're getting even distribution across the whole space. So you can divide up your planting, divide up your seeds into smaller amounts and sections. Um, you can plant those large fluffy grass seeds and tiny little wildflower seeds separately. So you don't end up with weird clusters of seeds in one spot. And you can bulk up and mix the seed with a filler to help get that even distribution as possible. So things like sawdust or compost sand, uh, crack corn, kitty litter. Um, that just helps bulk it up and spread it out more evenly across the space. After seeding, all you wanna do is make sure that those little seeds get good contact with the soil, but not burying them too deep. So you can gently tamp them down by walking across the planting area, or you could roll them out with a cult packer or a lawn roller. Two more slides here and I'll be done with meadows. <laughs> I didn't wanna get the questions answered. After seeding, the first year is all about weed control again taking care of the bullies. You wanna take care of those weeds that you missed during site prep while the wildflowers are taking their time to kind of establish underneath. So in the first year, what you wanna do is high mow your planting or lop off the flowers of any weeds that might be trying to set seed in there. Anytime that vegetation reaches knee or thigh height, but take it back to about eight inches. So your typical lawnmower can't go higher than four inches. So you're gonna need something taller or you can get in there with a string trimmer and just take those uh, seed heads off or flowering heads off of the, the annual and biennial weeds that you missed. Then take a targeted approach to take out any small patches of weeds or individual plants of competitive weedy species that you don't wanna have in there. Um, get after that poison parsnip before it gets you. <laughs> Lots of different ways you can approach weed control, uh, hand weeding, string trimming, et cetera, in these early meadows. And then in the long term, meadows don't need nearly as much maintenance. The main reason that we manage them is to just keep them open. 
everything around here wants to be forest. So we mow to keep woody plants from taking over. This is true too, if you're just trying to maintain kind of a hay field or pasture that has a lot of great stuff in it already. Um, you might not need to mow every year, depending on how much woody encroachment you're getting. Um, and we would recommend mowing a third or less every year so that you leave the rest standing for winter cover, wildlife uh, cover and food. You could also just go in there and target the areas that have black locust or cottonwood or aspen or whatever other woody plants that are coming in. And then remove and spot treat weeds as needed. Keep an eye on patches of weeds like poison parsnip. Take care of those as needed. There are other options to consider for long-term maintenance of this, like prescribed burning and rotational grazing, but those are a little more complicated and I don't have time to cover them today. So if you have any questions, I am, I'm here for them. So that's it for me on this. Um, just wanted to remind you to check out the website to see the resources that we have on plants and pollinators and habitat restoration. Um, have a fact sheet with all the info that you could want on nesting and overwintering habitat including the info I covered today on plant stem management. We also have this great organic site preparation guide, which goes into much more detail on how you can use different methods for controlling weeds ahead of seeding a wildflower meadow. Again, all of these are available on our website as PDFs. And then one thing I didn't talk about today, but if you wanna know more about nursery pest management and what kinds of questions to ask to make sure that you're buying, um, relatively pesticide free plants, bee safe plants. We have these fact sheets on buying bee safe plants, which is a guide for consumers and offering bee safe plants, which is a guide for nurseries. And then finally, we are a donor supported nonprofit. Membership funding is what allows me to take on this type of outreach presentation and donors can receive a pollinator habitat sign or a leave the leaves sign along with their membership to Xerces. So thank you to all of the Xerces members out there that make my work possible. Thanks so much for your time and attention. I will take questions. Emily, we had a question about um, the leaves. If you want to rake up leaves in the spring, when is the best time to do that? So um, if you're wanting to, I would say, you're waiting, you're wanting to wait until um, the, you know, the ambient temperatures are pretty warm and consistently warm. Um, I tend to leave the ones that I have left for mulch in my garden beds and around my trees. Just, um, I don't clean them up at all. Um, but if in the, in the, you know, if you're out in your sort of more grassy yard spaces and you're wanting to break those up without disturbing as many insects. You're wanting to wait until ambient temperatures are, um, you know, in the 60s basically before those are. Uh, and at that point, you're probably already seeing some of that breakdown, but that will at least get those life cycles started. There was also a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jill. Well, um, Emily, another question is about um, plants that aren't particularly pollinator friendly and, and treating like the hostas and the peonies. Um, uh, are there plants that get a buy when it comes to waiting until spring to cut them back? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I guess I feel um, I will be cleaning up some of my peonies um, and I've I won't be cleaning up pastas mostly because of time. Um, but if you're thinking about just creating stem nesting habitat or not, those are generally not the ones that are creating a ton of, uh, of wildlife habitat in the way that some of the native perennials are. Um, so yeah, I think if you're, if you're wanting to tidy up certain parts of your yard, those are the areas that I would focus on. Um, I'm probably uh, on the, on the side of the spectrum of, less is always more unless there's plant diseases involved. So I won't be tidying up anything except the peonies that have some powdery mildew. So speaking of the disease plants, can you talk a little bit more about that? Where should you dispose of them? And um, how, how, when should you cut them down and how short should you cut them? Um, so I'm gonna cut them down to the ground. Um, and I'm going to be bagging them up and um, disposing of them with my trash. Um, that's what I plan on doing with the ones that have, you know, diseases, because those diseases will get carried over into the next season if I if I don't take care of them. Um, 
so yeah, those, those are like my peonies have powdery mildew. My pea balm has powdery mildew. Um, and then the apple leaves, I'm just planning on, on flail mulling them, um, and leaving them be, but, um, I won't be bagging up those cause I don't have any real means of, um, of bagging them up. Um, I hope that's helpful. What's, what's flail mowing? Flail mowing is just making sure that the, um, the leaves get mowed up into shreds uh, as small as possible. So for me, that's going to mean I just have a lawn mower, so I will be running it back and forth underneath my apple tree probably multiple times to try and make sure that those apple leaves are getting um, shredded up as best as I can. Emily, there's a question about herbicide options that are not persistent, if, if you have any suggestion. I am, I am not allowed to make any specific herbicide uh, recommendations. Um, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll leave it at that. I think the best, um, the best resource for that um, typically is university extension. I know UVM doesn't have a ton on that. Um, but some of our neighbors in New York might have more information um, available. Thanks. There's a question about, is there a minimum diameter below which a plant stem is not useful to pollinators? For example, I was surprised to hear that bee balm is big enough to be used. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so bee balm will house, there's bees that are just super tiny. Um, you know, there are bees that get down to the size of almost like a freckle. Um, and so when they are looking for a, a plant stem or a tunnel nest, they're looking for one that's approximately the same size as the, uh, you know, the outside of their thorax so that when they go into the stem, it's, it's shaving off things like mites um, that they might have picked up on a flower. Um, so they want it to be kind of neat and tight right around their, their thorax as they go into that tunnel. So the, the size of that tunnel is going to determine which species uh, are going to are going to be using the stem. So something like a bee balm could house uh, a small carpenter bee, but it wouldn't be attractive to something like a mason bee that's that's much bigger um, that might need something that's more of like a six millimeter stem as opposed to a two millimeter stem. Okay, there's another question about when you mow the field and do just a third of it each year, is there any order that's recommended or it really doesn't matter, just rotate? Yeah, it really doesn't matter, just rotate. Um, there are folks that will just do haphazard mowing rather than rotating, you know, specific big patches every year. It really comes down to, you know, what equipment you have available. Are you like going to find a, um, somebody with a brush hog and contracting it out or are you doing it yourself? Um, I would start with, if you're looking for a place to start in a, in a meadow, look for the place that has woodies coming in. Um, and I would just start there. And sometimes that's the place that needs to continually be, um, be mowed. The main part of the route, the rotational mowing is just to leave, um, enough of that meadow standing that you're providing that overwintering shelter for, for wildlife in the rest of the planting. Emily, there's a question about the um, use of cardboard and composted manure, um, about whether or not it's essential to do the, I think the question is really, do we have to do the browns and the greens lasagna type? Um, is it going to look bad, blow away? <laughs> um, are there, is there anything you can add to, to help this person creating a pollinator garden? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the main reason to do the browns and the greens is to kind of get that composting um, effect going with the nitrogen material as well as the carbon material. Um, so if you were going browns only, you might not get uh, the same side of kind of like activation of, and, and decomposition that you would get if you did browns and greens. Um, but I think you can get pretty good effect just by going with a, a thick layer of cardboard and a thick layer of the composted manure as well. Um, if, yeah, I think, I think you can get a pretty good result just with those things. I've seen it done pretty well. Great. Um, someone says, I have a lot of black-eyed Susan. Are these good for overwintering insects? Totally. Yeah, black-eyed Susan are, are, are definitely a good stem to leave standing. 
um, for overwintering insects as well as just for the seed heads for birds to land on and, and forage on. Um, perhaps we have time for one more question. Jenny, have you got another one? Um, sure, one. this one's this one's interesting. Um, if prairie moon nursery seed did not germinate, should I replant or wait another season? As I am told, wildflowers can take two to five years to germinate. Oh, interesting. Um, they can take two to five years to mature, but if you got no germination, um, you could give it one more year and just make sure that you're getting enough, you know, moisture and sunlight and hope that some of those germinate. Sometimes you just have bad luck with seed mixes um, in terms of how those seeds were handled before they got to you. Um, and yeah, the, the, the two to five years to germination, I would give it one more year and see, uh, see if anything comes up from there. It's a little disappointing to hear that nothing came out of that mix um, in one year. See, I'm seeing that you followed the Prairie Moon Guide to Preparation, cardboard for three weeks, remove, yep, yep. Yeah, I would give it another, give it another season. Um, you could add in, you know, some additional species in there and, um, and see what happens if you compare it with um, other seeds of similar species. It could just be that you have a, you know, a bad lot of seeds for, um, from that last germination. Okay, Bethany says we have time for a couple more questions. There's one about, we had a Mason bee house last year. It was completely occupied, but nothing hatched in the spring. What went wrong? Hmm. Uh, did you have, um, I feel like I want to have a back and forth here. Did, were the, the nests were capped off with mud or were they capped off with grass? Um, I'm, I'm curious to know what kind of bee house it was. Was it, and nothing hatched throughout the entire year or just in the spring? Some of those mason bees aren't active until a little bit later. Mud is the answer to one of your questions, Emily. They were capped with mud? Yes. Okay, yeah, well, that's mason bees. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what happened. You could open up one of those nests and pull it out and see if you, um, sometimes, you know, those larvae will have things like talk brood affect them and they just kind of turn into goop behind the, you know, behind those end, mud end caps. Um, so you could open one up and, and see if there's anything in there. Okay, there's a question. I had lots of milkweed that seeded itself, but no butterflies came. What do I do with the green seed pods? Can I scatter them over my field? So uh, inside the green seed pods will be the actual seeds. Um, and you can, so you could certainly open those up and scatter them over your field. I would say if you're interested in this, we have this really great milkweed guidance document on the website, which shows pictures of like when those seed pods are actually re ready to harvest um, and to collect seed from. Um, so I would take a look at those before harvesting the green seed pods. But you can absolutely open those up and, and scatter seeds over your fields to keep milkweeds seeding themselves out. Is it okay to pin oak leaves or should they be shredded with a mower? Thought you said one should not shred leaves, but heard you mention you plan to flail mow your apple leaves. So I would leave pin oak leaves. I'm shredding my apple leaves because my apple trees uh, are burdened with all kinds of diseases and pests. And so I'm trying to keep them from harboring those um, over the winter and, and making problems for myself next year. Um, but pin oak leaves, I would absolutely leave uh, and not shred up with a mower. Okay. Um, have you had any experience trying to get rid of goutweed in a potential, uh, in a potential pollinator garden spot? Any advice? Ooh, uh, Gatweed's a challenging one. <laughs> um, I would just say persistence of, of trying to get after it. Um, Gatweed is a real challenging one in those like shady spots. Same with creeping uh, bellflower. It's just a matter of persistence and continually sort of pulling them up um, as they appear. I don't have any magic solutions for those because I, I'm dealing with the same problems myself. Yeah, I think. Um, there's one more question for plants that aren't going to be used for nesting, specifically asters that are still flowering and feeding the bees now, 
when, if at all, should I cut them down? I wouldn't cut them down. I would just leave them standing. Does anyone have any questions they want to put in the Q and A? Okay, I think that might be it. This has been wonderful, Emily. Thank you so much. So many of us. I think Bethany said maybe a um, hundred and eighty people registered for the webinar tonight, and more people uh, will be will have access to it through uh, the recording, which um, will be posted when that becomes available. Um, this effort is a growing one in more than one sense, and it's wonderful to see how many people are interested in uh, being part of the, this movement to improve habitat for pollinators, for our native bees, and um, the other um, insects, birds, and uh, animals that depend on them. So um, I think we're ready to um, say goodbye. This has right. been great. There was one last question, Jill, about um, where will this be posted, the recording? This will be posted on the PPAC YouTube page, um, which there is, a, the Pollinator Pathway of Addison County has its own YouTube channel with a few of the webinars from the spring on it. Um, so you can search that on YouTube and this will come up. I will try and get to it in the next week or two. 